So thank you. We are here for the geology of Lummi Island with Elizabeth Kilinowski. My name is Katie Johnson and I'm the community engagement coordinator for the Heritage Trust. And I'm so excited you're all here. This is a really fascinating topic and it's really a great piece of what we do. Um, the land conservation organization out here, we work to preserve and protect this place forever. And one of the ways we do that is through inviting our community to learn about the place and to help spread the word. So thank you guys for joining us. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome Elizabeth Kilinowski. She's one of our board members and a geologist and knows a great deal about this land and this area. And us. I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth to thrill us with more about the geology of Lummi Island. Well, I hope so. Okay, so I'm going to try to scare, uh, share my screen and Katie is going to let me know if it's working. Okay. It's looking good. Okay, let me see if it's showing the presentation yet. Um, okay, that's what I... Okay, so thanks for coming and I welcome feedback as I hope to continue to be doing this talk in the future. Um, there's a lot to learn uh, regarding the rocks on the island and older papers to read. So this is just a touch of what's out there to, dis to discover. And I encourage everyone to get out uh, and explore. At the end of the talk, if there's time, I'm going to show you a few books that I've used as well. Some of the photos I'm going to show you were taken while I was on private property with owner per permission. And many of them were taken on the beach at very low tide. This is, um, there's quite a bit of public beach on the island. However, some of it's difficult to access either because one needs the permission of a property owner to get to the beach or the beach can only be reached by boat uh, such as at the Southern end of the island. The county has a really nice GIS tool on their front page now of their website where you can zoom into Lummi Island and check the titlands for ownership. Contact me later if you need help uh, with any of this, if you try to do that. I have a lot of material. So what I'm gonna do is break before the end of the slides to give Katie, to let Katie see these things and then continue if there's time and interest. <clears throat> So this is what I'm going to talk about, and then if there's time, we'll go for a short virtual walk with just a couple of slides around the outer preserve. The walk will be based on a tour that Kent Nielsen developed when he lived on the island. He's a retired geologist. I also have a few photos from the other preserves. I'm going to go over geologic basics, things that you need to know, such as basic rock types and the rock cycle. Many of you will know a lot of this material already, or at least some of it. And then I'm going to put into a regional context covering uh, plate tectonics and the Cascadia subduction zone. I'll talk a little about um, the basic geology of the San Juan Island region, including Lummi Island. And then I'll focus in on the rocks and shoreline of Lummi Island and add a little geography using some old maps of the island. Finally, we'll do a brief tour of the trust preserves with a focus on Otto and Aston, uh, if there's time. I want to acknowledge all of the people that I've relied on uh, as I've relied on them for some of what I plan on uh, talking about tonight. And some of you will remember Clark Blake, the geologist who's retired from the USGS who lived part-time on the island for a number of years. I did several geology walks with him. And a couple of these people put out early papers based on graduate work that was done as far back as the 1950s. And again, I want to acknowledge the work of Ken Nielsen and uh, some very useful books by Ned Brown. Um, all of the three basic rock types are found on Lummi Island as bedrock. That's a uh, rock that's in place and not carried there by a glacier or moved there uh, by somebody with a backhoe. There's igneous rock in the form of basalt down there on the right. Um, like that found at Point Migley, the outer preserve and several other places on the island. Basalt is from magma and came from deep in the earth. Rocks like this are called magmatic. Uh, it flowed out either in volcanoes, both on land and underwater, think of the Hawaiian Islands, uh, or at oceanic rift zones, such as the Mid-Atlantic Rift and the East Pacific Rise, where the plates that cover the earth split apart. 
The basalt found at Point Migley is fractured pillow basalt. And you can see kind of that form there. Pillow basalt uh, forms when molten rock oozes out of the rift zone and hits the water and forms what looks like pillows. Um, the mineral grains are very small and the rock is made up of only a few basic minerals, such as pyroxene and amphibole and some others. It's fine grained because it cooled rapidly. Other igneous rocks on Lummi Island are coarser grained. They're also magmatic, such as tonalite, one of the granitic rocks found on the Otto Preserve. Coarser grained rocks had a longer time to cool, so the mineral grains are larger. Then we have sedimentary rocks, such as the Chuckanut sandstone that's found on the northern part of the island as bedrock. This rock is about 50 million years old and its origin is somewhat local. It's eroded from continental sources. There are two general types of sedimentary rock, once called plastic, such as conglomerates, sandstone, siltstone, and shale. The other is chemical, which can include inorganically derived rock like iron ore, some cherts, and some limestones, or it can yeah. be organic. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That is uh, coal, some cherts, some limestones, some dolomite. <coughs> uh, finally, we have metamorphic rock, such as greenstone that underlies much of Lummi mm -hmm. Island, which is somewhat metamorphic basalt. The pyroxene and amphibole minerals that make it up have been altered to minerals like chloride. There's also the great wacky sandstone from the quarry, and that's what I show there in the lower left. That's been slightly metamorphosed. We don't have bedrock uh, on the island that I know about that's been significantly metamorphosed, such as gneiss or schist. But there's gneiss and schist that you find on the beaches that were dropped by the retreating glaciers that covered the island thousands of years ago, or is eroded out of the bluff sediments also left over by the glaciers. So this cartoon shows how hot magma rises through the earth and extrudes from volcanoes, sometimes explosively. This type of rock cools quickly and it's fine grained. Other rock from deep in the earth can rise and stay down uh, and cool slowly. And that forms magma chambers. Uh, the grains are coarser. This is igneous rock. Rock at the surface uh, gets to the surface and then over time is eroded transported and deposited and compacted and sedimented together and form sedimentary rock. That eventually gets buried and subjected to high pressures and temperatures and forms new minerals and we get metamorphic rock. And the cycle starts all over again. Um, down at the bottom is an example of how a rock can become metamorphic. That's Change, picture. Changes from the original rock shale here. Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, somebody is not muted and they should mute themselves, okay? Because I'm hearing some feedback. Okay, so um, shale here uh, goes under heat and pressure and it makes, in, makes it into a different rock with a different character. Physical and chemical changes occur and new minerals are formed. This process can start at about 200 degrees Celsius. Rocks like the one down at the bottom there called gneiss can have a planar foliation, meaning that the grains can have a preferred orientation. Some rocks can be non-foliated. An example of that is marble, which is metamorphosed limestone that's made up of the mineral calcite. When limestone is subjected to heat and pressure, it becomes marble. And depending on what other minerals are in it, it can take on different colors. So the, the Earth has seven major tectonic plates and many minor ones. The largest of those is the Pacific plate, and then we have the North American plate as the next largest. In this cartoon, you can see that the North American plate is moving west and the Pacific plate moves northwest, while the Juan de Fuca plate, um, right next to the Pacific North American plate, uh, is subducted under the North American plate. The seafloor descends into the mantle and it's being overridden by the North American plate. A wedge of material builds up there as the plate goes down and meets the resistance of the overriding plate. The North American plate is called the crustal plate and the Juan de Fuca plate is an oceanic plate because it's underwater. There's a small plate to the north near Heidegger called the explorer plate and there's one to the south called the Gordo plate. 
at depths shallower than about 30 kilometers or so, the Cascadia subduction zone is locked by friction. And you can see that right here. Um, while stress slowly builds up as the subduction forces act until this false frictional strength is exceeded and the rocks slip past each other along, uh, <clears throat> along, the, fault, along the fault in a mega thrust earthquake. Below the transition zone uh, down here, evidence suggests that the fault slides continuously and silently at long-term plate slip rates of about two to five centimeters a year. This zone is about 45 kilometers below Victoria and 70 kilometers uh, below Vancouver. Great earthquakes have occurred at least seven times in the last 3,500 years with a return interval of 400 to 600 years. The last megaquake was in 1700. There will be more megaquakes and they will be large. You might have heard about the slow slip episodic, episodic tremor and slip phenomena, which is periodic slippage that happens about every 12 to 14 months or so. It's been studied for a few decades now. Uh, part of the area below that transition zone slides in slow slip events or stick slip types of behavior over a shorter lifespan of a few weeks or so. This relieves the plate boundary stresses in some areas, but may also add to stress on other locked parts of the fault. When a large earthquake happens, some areas of the Pacific Northwest are going to rise and some will fall. Right now, the Olympic Peninsula is rising as it's being squeezed, and the area around San Juan Island is falling. When a great earthquake happens, the Olympic Peninsula will subside and other areas are going to rise. The most recent work that I've seen um, seems to indicate that Lummi Island in the Bellingham area will not have a large earth displacement like what happened in Alaska in 1964, uh, where there was a 30 foot land rise near Kodiak. So this is a cross section of the Pacific Northwest showing the subducting Juan de Fuca plate going under the North America plate and the locked zone. And you can see that arrow uh, points to the locked zone. This shows um, the rigid lithosphere of the earth and the more plastic asthenosphere. Heat and magma rises into the Cascadia volcanoes and they explode with great force. This is a very simplified geologic map showing the San Juan Islands and Lummi Island. Look at Lummi Island and contrast it with the other islands such as Orcas and San Juan Island. Note the complexity of the, these islands geologies as compared to Lummi Island. A cross section uh, from A, A up here down to A prime below Fidalgo Island at the southern end uh, of Fidalgo, that, that thin black line there uh, would show a stacked group of uh, formations on top of one another. That's a series of thrust faults. A thrust fault has a dip of 45 degrees or less. The legend at the lower left down here um, shows the color-coded formations. For Lummi Island, um, um, the two main colors are the yellows showing the Chuckanut formation and the gray-green that shows the Lummi formation. And the Lummi formation consists of an ocean floor assemblage with pillow basalt, ribbon chert, uh, which is layers of chert with compacted sediment in between, and gray wacky. The gray wacky is the exposed rock on the south part of the island. So geologists use these type of charts to show the ages of rock formations in relationship to each other. This is a very simplified version, but it's useful here to show some of the age relations, relationships of the local rock units. The turtleback complex is the oldest in the San Juan Islands, but, and is thrust, but it's thrust above the East Sound group. The world's oldest rocks are found in Canada and Australia. They've been recycled from even older rocks. For Lummi Island, we're going, only going to be talking about rocks that are less than 200 million years old, from the Jurassic and younger. So topographic maps, which you've all seen, um, are, uh, are what we have here. The brown lines show contours that are each 20 foot 
uh, intervals of elevation. The closer the line, the steeper the slope. And you can see the lines are really close together down there on the west, southwest side along the island. And the uh, north end of the island is pretty flat. Uh, LIDAR maps have a lot more information. And LIDAR is a remote sensing method that I'm going to show examples of later. The dashed lines that I drew over five areas show the outcrops that are not the chuckanut or the gray wacky rock. These are igneous rocks. And Igneous rocks in the Chuckanut Formation are in the northern half of the island. The volcanic rocks and older sedimentary rocks are in the south half of the island. There's also volcanics that show up in the north half. At Sunrise Cove, the three older rock types come together. So Point Migley up here at the top <clears throat> has pillow basalts and chert and limestone and some other things. Lover's Bluff over here has pillow basalts with mudstone between the pillows. The Auto Preserve has an igneous complex of basalt, gabbro, and tonalite that we'll talk about later. Uh, Sunrise Cove, there's an outcrop down here that has basalt, diabase, gabbro, sandstone, mudstone, and a sandstone mud, mudstone sequence along with chert. And then the mountain, the top of it is gray wacky, the top of the Lummi Formation that we see at the quarry. Off the west side of uh, Lummi Island, down here, there's ch chert and pillow basalt. And at, not, and at a knotty bay, there's pillow basalt and ch chert. Here in the center, there's uh, the Sunrise Cove Fault Zone. It effectively divides the island in half, and the two halves have a different geologic history. The southern portion of the island is dominated by a thick sandstone sequence, the top of the Lummi Formation. It consists of layers of sandstone and shale, and the field term is, is gray wacky, and it was deposited on the seafloor as a submarine fan. Think of it as an underwater landslide that could have been triggered by earthquakes. The seafloor under this fan might be the same ocean floor sequence seen on the northern half of the island, and it's about 150 million years old. The Chuckanut Formation at about 50 million years old sits on top of those older magmatic rocks that outcrop at Point Migley and Lover's Bluff. The Chuckanut was deposited in a more delta type environment after the basement rock had been uplifted. There's a time gap of about 100 million years between the magmatic rocks and the overlying Chuckanut Formation. There's no chuckanut found on the southern half of the island. The oldest rocks are similar north and south, but the overlying sandstones, the chuckanut and the gray wacky, are totally different. Over all of this, of course, we had several advances and retreats of mile thick glaciers. And it's thought that the land has rebounded about 300 feet from all the way to the ice. So I'm gonna shift just a little bit now and give you some geography and history. This is a detail of the San Juan Archipelago as depicted on the Spanish map of 1791. You can see Lummi Island up, up over here in this, this corner. Um, it's, uh, the map is from the voyage of Galeana and Valdez. They named the Lummi Island Isla de Pacheco after the Viceroy of Mexico at the time. And as you all know, people have been living in the Puget Sound area and all along the coast of England for thousands of years before the Europeans and Russians arrived. By the time early Russian and European explorers came by ship to the Pacific Northwest, diseases had already claimed the lives of these indigenous people. The writings of Vancouver and others described coming upon abandoned villages. In 1853, the US Geodatic Survey named the island Lummi. This is an interesting map. It's from 1873. In 1855, the Point Elliott Treaty was signed, which was the land settlement agreement between the US government and the indigenous peoples of the Puget Sound area. The Point Elliott uh, Treaty effectively confined the Strait Salish residents of Lummi Island and the surrounding areas, uh, Lummi Island and residents of the surrounding areas to reservations, one of which we all drive through on the way to the ferry. The Lummies and other tribes of the uh, Puget Sound areas are fishers, and confining the Lummi to a reservation with an attempt to turn them into farmers 
also started the war against their fishing rights. By the 1930s, the Lummi had been all but driven out of their fishing, except for a little subsistence fishing. By 1917, they were pushed out of their reef net fishery off Village Point and the other reef net areas, such as near Point Roberts, when whites started using fish traps that cut off the reef netters. In 1974, Judge George Bolt issued a decision that affirmed Native American fishing rights. And the rights of tribal fisheries, fishers are still being played out today. Before European settlers purchased or were granted land on the island, it had to be platted. And that was undertaken around 1873. And that's what this map shows. There's a couple of interesting features that I want to point out in the enlarged section at the bottom uh, left. The gray, gray curved line that you see here that follows uh, that sort of follows uh, the Legal Bay Road, uh, where Legal Bay Road is today, shows an old stream coming from a wetland. Today, there's still a lot of water that drains that area and goes under South Nugent to the beach. You can also see a drainage flowing south near the Village Point area. Lummi villages were in these areas, and you can still see shells from old middens in the bank of Donna Granger's Beach and in the ditch along South Nugent, south of the island. And we know there was a large Lummi village at Village Point. The key to finding the remnants of these old villages is identifying a freshwater source. There are a couple other places on the south, southeast side of the island where there are old middens. Now this is a map of Lummi Island from 1887. In the 1880s, the US Geodatic Survey made very detailed maps of the entire San Juan Islands and Bellingham area. The maps were housed in Washington, D.C., and a few decades ago, they were digitized and made available to the public. Not only are they very detailed, but the files can be zoomed in on for very great clarity. In 1887, almost all the island was in forest, primarily Douglas fir and cedar. The areas that I've circled are places where there appears to be homesteads or clearings. Uh, we do know from the 18... Uh, 95 photo in the upper right that there was still a Lummi village at Village Point. Um, Washington was granted statehood in 1889. The map looks a little funny because I had to piece uh, Point Midley, uh, which was from another map, uh, to the other one. It didn't, didn't work very well. Okay, so back to geology. This is a plan view of the northern end of the island from the 2006 aspect report water study that the county had done. This is the sort of map that geologists develop by looking at and exploring the terrain, taking rock samples and studying aerial photos and using other methods. Many times they take samples and cut very fine thin sections and look at the samples under a polarizing microscope in order to identify the minerals in the rocks. This helps to determine the origins of the, rock, of the rocks. The different colors indicate that the geology that can be assumed uh, from looking at the surface of the land. The green color down there at the bottom of the picture is the gray wacky member of the Lummi Formation. The purple color indicates the fault zone with the orange showing old beach deposit sands on top. The dotted red line infers that the fault line at the south end of the fault zone extends beyond where it can be identified at the surface. The red lines are related to faults none of which are active faults. Uh, when the line is dotted, it's inferred, and when it's solid, it shows confidence that it's there. The blue lines are folds in the rock formations, giant folds. Again, the lot, dotted line is inferred and the solid line shows confidence of its existence. The arrows that are associated with the lines show either an anticline or a syncline, as depicted in the cartoon in the bottom right. An anticline is a fold in the rock that's usually convex upward so that forms an arch with the core of it containing the older rock. A syncline is a fold in which the core contains the younger rock and it's a concave upward. The red color there indicates the chuckanut formation and the old orange and yellow colors are associated with glacial and old beach deposits. The other orange colors are associated with the um, igneous intrusive rocks at the Otter Preserve in Lover's Bluff and the rocks from Point Midway. 
Notice the areas um, where the chuckanut outcrops. There's a ridge above Village Point right here uh, and the area around the ferry dock by the Harmony House. But there's no chuckanut south of Legal Bay. So let's look at some close-ups of the chuckanut sandstone that outcrop uh, on the north part of the island. Um, on the island, it's composed mostly of sandstone. It has some shale and some conglomerate. You can say that, see the conglomerate in contact with the finer um, sandstone type um, down there or up in the upper, um, upper left. Uh, there is conglomerate along the North Nugent where the road was cut through in the 1950s, I believe, and where there was a small rock fall a few winters ago. It's the youngest bedrock unit in the San Juan Islands, and it's in our coast sandstone. It has a lot of quartz and feldspar minerals from a granitic pluton that weathered and eroded the rock, but didn't weather much quartz. Quartz is very hard, so there's a lot of quartz left in it. It eroded from local terrains. There are fossils in the Chuckanut, but there's not very many of those among the island that have been found anyway. Uh, one can find bits and pieces of coal in the rock there. It's tertiary age, which is uh, between 55 and 40 million years old. The Chuckanut formation has extensive coal seams that were mined in the Bellingham area until the 1950s. There are old tunnels that even go under Bellingham Bay from those mines. Here's some more examples of the chuckanut. You can see there's quite a variety of textures. The upper left photo shows cemented conglomerate above a cemented sand layer. The lower left photo is a close-up of the rock cut at, on North Nugent. This is an area that has a lot of small faulting going on, and some of the rock is very weathered and eroded. It's one of the reasons why there's continuous rockfall there. When we get a really wet winter, it adds to the instability of the area. Often in the winter, there are icicles there. The ice freezing and melting breaks up the rock. Uh, make sure you have a look at it when you drive by. Um, this is an example along the shore of Tufoni. Um, that's probably from the Greek word meaning tomb. It's found all over the world and in a wide variety of rock types. There needs to be permeable rock, like the chuckanut, a source of salt and repeated wetting and drying. Mineral grains disaggregate because of the salt evaporating after splashing up on the rock. Algae living on the rock protects the walls separating the cavities from further evaporation and erosion. We find this extensively in Chuckanut Bay near Bellingham and in the San Juans. In a few places, I've seen it higher than the water could reach at the time. That tells me that the sea level was higher in the past as the land was depressed the land rose after the glaciers melted. We might uh, still be getting a little bit of that glacial rebound, but not, not much. So this is Frank's Beach. Uh, and if you look closely at the rock when you're out there or at low tide, you'll notice that it's tilted out of the horizontal. That's indicative of the folding and faulting that has taken place here from tectonic uh, forces. And seal rock at the top of the island is a part of the San Juan National Monument. The interesting thing here is that the entire rock is chuckanut sandstone, but Point Migley, just a short distance away, is the ocean floor basalt complex. This rock is used as a haul seal haul out site, and in the summer it's covered with them. They're protected, and boaters are required to stay well aware from them, well aware, well away from them. And I want to publicly thank Sheila Marshall here for spending so much time making sure that seal rock was incorporated into the San Juan National Monument. I think she worked for about 30 years to try to get that rock protected, and she's done a good job. And Victoria Suse does a really good job of trying to keep those seals safe. Now let's look at the southern part of the island. Here we have the ocean floor assemblage, but this, this is the gray wacky part. The salt is at the bottom, uh, ribbon shirt is next, and it makes up a tiny, it's made up of tiny uh, biogenic radiolarites that are cemented together. And then on top, what we see here is the gray wacky. The gray wacky <clears throat> is part of the old ocean floor assemblage that underlies much of the San Juan Islands. 
it, there are outcrops of it at Rosario Head and in other places uh, in the San Juans. Again, basalt below, chert above the basalt, and then the gray wacky. On Lummi, you mostly see the gray wacky. It's about 2,500 feet thick where it is exposed on the west side of, of, of the island. Well, I want to go back. Um, it's made up of gray sandstone, dark shale, mudstone, and some conglomerate. And often, as in the quarry, which is now the eastern preserve, the rock is graded from coarser to finer as it goes upward. You can see that in the, uh, the upper left and the lower right uh, pictures. The layers are formed from underwater landslides that are sediment-laden turbidity, turbidity currents, so they're called turbidites. You can see them along the west side of the island too. Turbidity currents could be triggered when underwater sediment is shaken loose by earthquakes. Microscopically, the rock, the rock rings of the Lummi Formation are volcanic and chert. And that's known from researchers making thin sections of the rock and looking at them under a polarizing microscope. In the lower photos, you see, the, see quartz veins crossing the bedding. This is from hot water over 400 degrees Celsius penetrating the cracks during metamorphism and silica uh, forming the quartz. Nobody really knows for sure where these rocks originally came from, perhaps from an island arc out in the Pacific. It's dated at around 145 to 150 million years old. And the areas of the gray wacky can also be massive uh, and not show this uh, fine layering. Here's some more uh, examples of the gray wacky from the southwest side of the island. This is accessible by boat and makes for a great exploring at low tide. The upper right photo looks like uh, a little bit like Tifoni is forming, uh, as on the earlier picture that I showed of the Chukana formation. There's a great variety of patterns in this rock, and some of it is almost slate. The lower left uh, photo shows some really interesting jointing patterns. So let's go back up to the northern end of the island. Here's some photos from Point Migley that show the pillow of the salts and um, uh, along the beach and the contact between the basalt and the chuckanut sandstone in the lower photos. Um, note the greenish color of the rock. The photos show Jurassic pillow basalts and breccia, which is a plastic angular rock that's cemented into a fine grain matrix. There's also tuff, which is volcanic, diabase, which is a large grain dark rock. There's limestone and some chert. The chert gives ages of middle to late early Jurassic, which is about 160 to 200 million years uh, old. The Chuckanut Formation overlies this. Over at Lover's Bluff, we see again Jurassic pillow basalts that also seem like they might have some chert and, and interbedded mudstone of uncertain origin. Maybe it's gray wacky. This outcrop certainly needs more study. Over at Sunrise Cove, you'll recognize the altered pillow basalts up there in the upper left uh, that are similar to the Point Migley and Lover's Bluff rocks. This outcrop has chert with gray wacky above it and basalt below it. And it's also been rotated uh, so it's not horizontal. It has basalt with tonalite intrusions and diabase with fractures. Tonalite is a granitic rock, a uh, coarse grain rock with lots of quartz. Diabase is like a coarser grain basalt, but it's not as coarse as gabbro, which is like basalt, but with larger grains. So um, now I want to look at the Sunrise Cove Fault Zone using LIDAR. Uh, it's in the middle part of the island where the northern half seems to come together with the southern half. LIDAR is for light detection and ranging, and it's a remote sensing method used to study the surface of the earth. Um, it's often collected by airplane and it uses a laser. The laser unit clocks the time it takes a burst of light to reach the ground, bounce off, and return back to the starting point, which is in an airplane flying over the land in a grid pattern. There are millions of points that hit the rocks, trees, and the bare ground. So the data has to be processed and filtered later. What we have here is what's called the last return or the bare earth data. Looking at the bare earth of land shows features that, you, that can't be seen from the ground or by just flying over in an aircraft. 
It has revolutionized earth science, sciences, and it's now also used a lot in archeological work to find ancient settlements. You can see um, uh, Sunrise Road here. You can see the outcrop at Sunrise Cove. You can see the old gravel pit um, uh, at the uh, auto preserve. And you can see uh, Charlie Baker's stock pond here with the stream coming back down towards, uh, towards the water. And you can see how rugged the mountain is. Uh, and again, there's, there's no indication that there's been any, any activity on this since the last glacier was melting in the area. So it's a non-active fault zone. Um, there's a, this is a part of a set of maps from the San Juans and Long Island that was the lighter maps were taken in 2006. Uh, there's also some really interesting details from other areas uh, of the island, like you know, up on the north end of the island. So now I want to talk about glacial erratics. These are the rocks that are found on the beaches here on the island. And as you can see, some are huge. They're dropped out of the retreating glaciers or they're washed out of the bluffs. Walking the beaches is a fun way to learn about the rocks of the area. The shoreline on the southern half of the island is mostly public and can be accessed by boat. And again, check the property ownership before venturing out onto the beaches. In the upper right photo, uh, this erratic has iron in it. Uh, it could be greenstone that's oxidized. The one in the lower right is called the Jackass conglomerate. It's from the Jackass Mountain in Southern BC. It's the same rock as the rock that's in front of one of the Walking Community College buildings. It's cut from the Donovan, that one's cut from the Donovan uh, Street Rock that was blasted to make room for I-5 in uh, Bellingham decades ago. This rock didn't travel very far after it was picked up by the glacier. So a lot of times you'll see it, it won't be rounded or smooth if you find it in your backyard when you're digging a septic system or a foundation. But if it's on the beach for thousands of years, it can get pretty rounded. Here's some more erratics. Uh, the lower left one is very fine grained and greenish, so it's likely a greenstone. The upper right is huge, and it looks like it's granitic, but it's so covered with barnacles and other marine life that it's hard to determine. The upper left one might have formed when coarse-grained granite picked up some fine-grained basalt. <clears throat> and this one is pretty interesting. Uh, I was walking one of the beaches recently and found this glacial erratic. You can see the banding in it that's called foliation in the upper left, um, uh, which is the layering in the metamorphic rock. And then note the quartz vein running through it vertically. Uh, I, took another, I took an enlargement of it. I made an enlargement of it. The sparkles caught my eye. And when I looked closer, I found uh, in the lower left there that it was full of little garnets. Uh, some are only about five millimeters in size. Garnet's a common middle, mineral found in schist, a rock with a high aluminum content, such as shale that I showed in an earlier slide, is subjected to high heat and pressure and forms new minerals. Garnet can come in a variety of different colors too. If it contains chromium, uh, it might have a greenish color. So one thing I've become really interested in is uh, slope stability and instability over the past several years. And I have been walk I've been walking the beaches to try to understand why and how bluffs are eroding. These photos are from West Shore Drive and from the beach off that side of the island. There's large structures that the county's put in place. You can, you can see up there in the upper left uh, right here um, that uh, keeps the slope from impacting the road. And you can also see from the upper left that the road's been patched and it was patched again this past year. The lower left photo is an area that's particularly dangerous. This is just north of the willows and there's no shoulder at all. It's a drop off covered with brambles. This bluff gets strong wave action in the winter, especially from northerly storms. And sometimes owners of the bluff uh, clear, clear the bluffs of vegetation that only adds to the instability of the slope. When we get heavy rains and high tides, we have a lot of bluff erosion. A few years ago, uh, a large section of the bluff below West Shore Drive took out a walkway and structure that's been there for years. 
This is how the bluff looked later. And again, in the lower left, you can see trees cut down, which increases the instability of the slope by killing the vegetation that helps to stabilize the bank. This is on a high bluff off the west side of the island, where there's also a lot of erosion from wave action pounding on the bluff at high tide from water in the soil and sometimes vegetation remo uh, removal. I wanna point out this hole in the bank. Uh, places like this can be pumping water along clay liners so that even when a homeowner puts drainage piping from their lawns over the bank to drain to the shoreline, there will still be water that can migrate laterally and contribute to slope failure. And as you can see from the lower right photo, some homeowners put in very elaborate structures to try to stabilize the bank. This one took a lot of work. The two upper photos in this slide show drainage piping put in place by the county to better control how the water from the ditches gets to the beach. And you can see my husband, Bert, down on the left in the lower photo, uh, giving you an idea of the sense of the height of the bluff in that area. Right in front of him is a, very, is a new large slide that came off the smooth area above it. Many of the ho older homes along this bluff are really close to the edge and there's continuing continuing, uh, continual erosion here. On this slide, the two upper photos show very recent erosion from this past winter. Again, in the lower right, you can see an example of a homeowner removing most of the stabilizing vegetation from the bank. Now I wanna shift to well lawns. <clears throat> Hope everybody's still with me. Um, and the great, uh, so this is a well log and a photo of the glacial overburden that covers the island. As you can see from the height of those bluffs uh, earlier, it's, uh, it's a very deep section, very deep sections of the island. Well logs tell us a great deal of information about what's below the surface. And the well logs on Lummi Island are public records kept at the Department of Ecology. And it's one of the most important ways that researchers can determine what's beneath the ground. Bill Sullivan did his master's degree work on the hydrogeology of Lummi Island. He used well logs extensively to figure out where the aquifers were generally located. This photo is of a bluff face, but it gives one a very good idea of what a well might drill into. This, there's a fine sand layer, a coarser layer, more sand, and some clay. On the right is a well log of one of the deepest wells on the island. It was drilled in 1992 and it's 368 feet deep, but it enters the greenstone rock that lies beneath the glacial overburden and the Chuckanut Formation above Village Point. It goes through a sand and gravel layer into the Chuckanut sandstone through a coal seam and hits the greenstone layer at 340 feet. Okay, I'm gonna stop here for a time check and let Katie say a few things. So, the Heritage Trust has four preserves, uh, and I'm going to do a snapshot of, um, of each of them. Um, the newest preserve is Aston, which isn't open to the public yet. Hopefully, over the next fall and winter, the old pilings and structures are going to be removed, and restoration can begin so that it can open up to the public. Much of the work's been delayed because of the pandemic. So, okay, so. This is a blow up of a, of a top, topographic map of the auto preserve that Kent Nielsen drew uh, showing features of the preserve. The tannish area in the center is the outcrop of igneous rock that, we, that we'll talk about. Uh, you can see the main loop trail, the Walden Walk and the Baumgart Wood Trails, but he made this before Betty's loop was added. The horizontal blue lines are suggested fault lines. Uh, the faults are small scale faults and they're not hazardous. The vertical blue line near the bottom of the outcrop cuts the horizontal fault and it's younger than the older one. This is a LIDAR map that gives us a lot more detail about the preserve, preserve and the surrounding area. It shows that the igneous outcrop extends outside and to the east of the preserve. You can clearly see the outline of the gravel pit, pit um, but there's also another really interesting feature that the top arrow points to. It's a very old landslide that was pretty large. This flat area is really the only such uh, beach area on that side of the island. 
and there are houses there now. So it's, very, it's a very old slide. There's another smaller slide where the middle arrow uh, points to. This side of the island also has high bluffs that are constantly eroding, but they don't get as much wave action as the west side of the island. <clears throat> uh, this is the wellhead and the well log for the outer preserve. Uh, the wellhead is in the meadow just outside the resource center. The well is 149 feet deep with 13 different layers. They're all sedimentary later, layers, primarily clay. There's a nine foot thick layer called hard pan, which is compacted glacial sediment. Looking at other wells drilled in this east-west trending valley that's parallel to Sunrise Road shows that they all penetrate similar sediments. It's not clear how thick these sediments are, but they're all at least 200 feet, but they're at least 200 feet thick and extend below sea level. This is a trough filled with sediment. The origin is the glaciation uh, that's from at least 12,000 years ago. So the rock with the plaque at the start of the main loop trail is rounded on one side and more angular on the other. other. It shows that one side was exposed to the elements for some time. The grooves and striations are from glacial ice moving over the rock. That's pretty clear when you just walk up to it. And there are also other places on the island bedrock where you can see these uh, striations. The composition is similar to the rocks that make up most of the hill in, uh, at, at uh, the outer preserve. And if you could look up into the woods, you could see that hill rises steeply and about 140 feet to the top. The hill is much more resistant to erosion than the sediments near the well, uh, the outer rock and, and the near the well area and this rock and resource center. So if we turn right and follow Walden Loop Trail over to the gravel pit, we can see nature taking its over. It's been in, inactive for decades now, and volunteers recently replanted it with some oaks, madrone, and short pine to add to the forest diversity of the preserve and to add some stability to that slope. You can see that the steep slope is unnatural and the sediments are loosely bound. You can see the head wall of the quarry and the floor in the flat area below. There are a lot of cobbles and some larger rock. This is similar to what you'd see on the beach bluff. The rocks are rounded and smooth and show the power of glaciers that carried them and ground them smooth. Then <clears throat> going up to the upper, going clockwise, uh, walking up the trail, moving clockwise in the photos, we leave the gravel pit and head north, moving from the sediments left by glaciation to the harder rock with a thin soil layer. Up to the right, you can see some rocks that form a rise. That little rise is part of an er erosional fault scarp, and it extends east-west across this part of the island. North of this line of rocks, there are hard magmatic rocks that are exposed at the preserve or are covered by a very thin layer of sediment. South of this is the trough filled with a large thick sequence of glacial sediment. Where that fault line crosses the main road uh, or the main trail, uh, groundwater flows along the line and it's pooled in the low area. Springs are common along fractures and faults because water can flow easily there. If we follow the main trail back to, if we follow that trail back to the main route and then head north to the, and then to the west past the bench, we go to the, get to the Baumgarten Trail. Along this trail, we start walking over the basement rock, as you can see in the lower left photo. The two important rocks here are the tonalite, as seen in the upper right photo, and the basalt in the lower right. The dark basalt has fine crystals, so we know that it cools quickly near or at the surface of the earth. It contains the minerals calcium, iron, and magnesium. There can also be some gabbro here, which is a coarser grain version of basalt. Tonalite is the light colored granitic rock with larger crystals that indicates it cooled slowly deep in the earth. Its minerals are plagioclase, quartz, biotite, uh, and biotite, uh, which is a mica mineral. Uh, there's also a longer uh, dark colored mineral that's an amphibole. At the Otter Preserve, we can determine the relative ages between these rocks by looking closely. The basalt has the light color, has light color veins going through it. These veins have small mineral grains that are the same ones as the tonalite. The basalt was solid and broken to pieces and the tonalite was able to squeeze into the cracks. So the tonalite is younger. 
Ages were determined by earlier researchers using uh, uranium-led methods of dating. There's a rock at the Resource Center that I call the Bob Fodor Rock for the islander who found it. He found it on the Baumgart Trail, and it's uncharacteristic of what usually is seen as uh, seen here, as it's a, as it's a very fine-grained mudstone, stone, mudstone. It likely formed in a low oxygen environment like the seafloor. It has uh, light layers that, are, that have small veins of the tonalite that we see in this area. Somehow it was incorporated into the magmatic rocks here. But we might have found another one that's similar that was pulled up by a falling tree. As you can see on the left, uh, that's the falling tree. Last winter, when we had the strong winds from the west, several large trees that were growing on this thin soil toppled over and pulled rock up with it. In the upper right photo, uh, you can see the reddish looking part in contact with the white area. I didn't take, get a close look at it that day that I took the photo because it was raining really hard. But I plan on going back to retrieve it and leave it at the resource center along with the Bob Fodor rock. So if we continue, the trail continues uh, on crossing the magmatic rocks until we get back to the main loop trail uh, and head south again. And that's the little uh, right picture. Back along the main loop trail, we stop at the big rock uh, along the left of the trail that's getting completely covered with moss and ferns. This is a basalt basaltic rock with fine grains that has light colored intrusions. In thin section, it shows that the rock's highly altered. The fault that we no noted before continues across the hill and crosses the trail just south of this rock. If you look up the hill, uh, you can just, in the bottom photo, you can just see the top of the outcrop. So we walk back off the hard igneous rock onto the glacial sediments and back to the resource center. Although the exposures here at Auto Preserve are distinct, they're thought to be associated with the same exposures that are at Point Migley, Lover's Bluff, and Anadi Bay. The Doggo and Grainis Islands to our south have similar rock sequences. Okay, to the Acer Preserve. The Heritage Trust purchased the 105 acres that included the quarry and the 20 acres that had been mined, along with the adjoining forested uplands in 2015, after the property went into the receiver, went, went into receivership. The quarry has been mined off and on since the 1930s, but at a really small scale and with a big time gap of no mining until it started back up again in the 1960s. But it wasn't until 1999 when the property changed hands and mining, that mining uh, began in earnest. You can see the difference even between 2007 and the 2012 photos that I took from a bowl. Mining here was a challenge as the layers of rock that you saw in the earlier photos, the gray wacky I showed uh, of this part of the island are weak and because they're not resistant to sliding uh, in parallel, because they're not resistant uh, to sliding in parallel to the horizontal stratigraphy. Um, through subduction and then uplift, there was a lot of folding and faulting that went on. Even though some of this rock looks solid and massive, a lot of it is weak and easily broken. The bedding planes of this entire area are dipping at a 45 degree angle towards the water. It's called the dip slope. So mining here had to be done such that it was not undercut and the slope subject to collapse. There's also a lot of groundwater that comes out of this rock adds to the lubrication and also makes it subject to slope failure. The mining company had to cut the slope back. And in order to do that, they put in some unpermitted roads uh, to access the top area, which was out of their mining permitted area. Some of this rock was crushed and used for road bedding and some bigger pieces were used as riprap to shore up river banks or used in breakwater materials such as in Squalicum Harbor. Most of it in recent years was barged south of, out of Washington County and taken to other parts of Washington. At this time, the property is not open to the public except for public tours and volunteer opportunities. And if you want to help out, please talk to Katie. There's jobs to be done. Uh, permit planning for restoration works in progress and the trust is working hard to secure grants in order to get the actual restoration work finished. By the time 2013 came along, there were at least seven of these benches that you see 
uh, especially in the lower left uh, um, uh, slide or uh, picture. And there was a long street scree slope that you can see in the lower photos. Uh, these pictures are from 2020. This was used to push, push big rock over off from the upper benches. The upper photo shows a small fault cutting through the more massive uh, rock unit. The photo here uh, in the upper left shows something called the slip and sign. It's this, the surface of the rock is polished and striated uh, as a result of friction along the fault plan, plane. You can tell which way the rock faulted by seeing and feeling the smoothness in one direction and the roughness in the other. In this case, the mineral is chlorite, uh, which is the greenish, a greenish rock uh, that was crystallized between the layers. <clears throat> and Here's some more examples from the Aston Preserve. You can see the turbidite bedding and how the whole section is tilted out of the horizontal in the bottom uh, right. The lower left shows what we call rip-up clasps that form when pieces of mud or clay or other sediments get picked up and incorporated into a flow like a turbidity current and then carried along some distance. Later, the entire flow is solidified. Okay, I want to quickly show you a slide of photos from the Curry Preserve on the north end of the island. I started at the Tuttle Lane entrance and walked through the woods and down to the meadow. As you can see from this rock, we walked over the exposed Chuffanut Formation. That's um, down in the left, uh, 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 left hand photo. Uh, the Chuffanut Formation runs, runs in a ridge from southeast to northwest in this area. As you walk out of the woods, uh, you leave the ridge and walk onto the old glacial and beach sediments where the land drops toward the rain spit. And finally, we end at the Washington Department of Fish and Wild, uh, Wildlife Overlook just past the Baker Preserve, where again, all the exposed rock is the gray wacky, uh, which is the top of the Lummi Formation. Uh, and I think I should end there and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Wow, Elizabeth, that was phenomenal. <laughs> I have some, one last thing, I have some really good books here for people if they're interested. One is called The Geology of the San Juan Islands, and the other is called Mountain Building Geology in the Pacific Northwest. These are both by Ned Brown, a retired professor from Western, who did an enormous amount of work uh, in this area. And then one other book uh, by uh, Geology Underfoot in Western Washington by a friend of mine, Dave Tucker. And these are all available at Village Books. That's it. Amazing, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. That was so cool. I feel like I just learned so much about this place and this area. Uh, and I just want to thank all of you for being here with us tonight. This was so wonderful. I learned so much. I really hope that you guys enjoyed it as much as I did because that was fantastic. Um, if you do have to hop off, I totally understand. It is just past eight o'clock. But if you want to stay around for some questions and answers, uh, please keep, stay with us. And if, anybody, uh, and if anybody has any particular questions or wants more information, uh, send an email to Katie and she'll send it along to me. And I can answer questions. This is a lot more fun in person. <laughs> <laughs> So Elizabeth, there was just one that came through the chat that I just wanted to confirm real quick. Um, when you were talking about the Chuckanut sandstone, did one of those have some petrified wood in it? No, I don't think it is. Um, there, there is some things that might look like petrified wood um, on the island, but they're actually uh, more um, jointed structures like what's found in Chuckanut Bay that for a long time people thought were uh, petrified uh, trunks, uh, palm trunks, but there can be jointing like that in rocks. And what I showed was not uh, was not a fossil. Cool. There are there is a lot of fossils in the Chuckanut sandstone, and they find a lot of it up uh, 
in, in other parts of Whatcom County. And it's possible there's some on the island that hasn't been exposed yet. But you know, you can't just go digging around. <laughs> We're looking either. Yeah, I think Pete has a question. Where? Um, he raised his hand. <laughs> oh, okay. Are you with us, Pete? Pete, turn. Oh, is that me? Yeah, that's you. Yeah. Well, I have a story actually that has to do with bedrock. Uh, my dad, when he was growing up on the island in the mid-20s, he was just a little guy. He remembers a story of his older cousins and some other hooligans on the island got a hold of a, a box of dynamite from the logging operations that were going on in the mountain. Oh, my God. They went up, they went up to Curry's land and found some of that sandstone bedrock and set this this uh, case of dynamite off, and it it blew sky high. It blew windows out all over the island because it was on bedrock. It was heard in Bellingham, and of course, oh my God. lots of lots of uh, police came out, and it was quite a quite a show. Apparently, now when when was that? Oh, in the mid twenties. In the mid twenties. You know, some of that rock is probably still laying around. <laughs> Where is it? Yeah, it would have been it would have been right in the Curry Preserve where you see some sandstone out, outcrops. I don't know who owned that property back then. It wasn't John Curry. It was before John Curry's time. You know, I think I might know what you're talking about. Because I yeah, I'm gonna look. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Pete. That's a great story. So there was another question that came through on the chat. Um, and it says, there was one photo with a very dark side and a light side, a very distinct line between them. What types of rock were that one? I don't know which slide that was in. Very dark and a light side. Uh, Huh. I wonder if it was one of the erratics that you showed. It might have been. No, maybe not early on in the presentation. Well, there was one that I showed at the Chuckanut uh, formation where there was a conglomerate uh, cemented against uh, finer grain sandstone. And that was all part of the Chuckanut formation. And that could be caused by, you know, uh, um, uh, sand coming down, uh, uh, all sand coming down, and then in a, another wave of uh, just this big bunch of uh, rock coming down on top of that, and then it all got cemented together in, in like a river situation, a delta situation. Gotcha. Cool. Um, so another one came through. What kind of formations or bedrock form the best aquifers? Good question. Well, the glacial, the glacial till, because it's, it's not cemented together as much and the water is held in suspension between the, uh, between the sand, uh, uh, be between the sand layers. The, the gray wacky rock, there are a couple of wells drilled into the gray wacky rock and the only place that you're really getting water is from cracks and fissures. Uh, and mostly it's not uh, very, there's not very good uh, flow out of those, uh, very low flow. And there's a lot of, there's a number of wells in greenstone uh, and that's also very low flow. That's a real solid rock um, and you know fine grained and uh, solid so it would have to be um, um, cracks cracks in it hmm. so glacial till would probably give you the the best uh, aquifer cool and of course we know that there's arsenic in the chuckanut too that's that's there's natural arsenic in chuckanut formation and Isaac uh, and Mike have an article in, uh, in their Lummi Island um, 
their Lummi Island website about the arsenic uh, in the water. They just posted that this last week. Cool. Scott, did you have something? I think I muted him by accident. Oh. <laughs> um, there was another question that came through. So when the big one finally hits, ignoring the tsunami damage, how well do you think the island would fare compared to the Bellingham area? I know this is kind of an unfair question, but I'm curious too. I think we're gonna fare pretty well. Uh, for one thing, this, um, I, uh, you know, the newer houses are, are built to uh, pretty good standards as far as seismic standards go. We're considered a D3 uh, for building now, uh, but that's only been in place, I think, 20 years or less. Once it was identified that we, you know, we live in a place where we're going to get huge earthquakes. So um, some of the newer homes, I think, are going to do pretty well. Um, I don't personally think that we're going to have much of a trouble with a, with a tsunami here. Uh, the idea that we're going to get a huge wave is a little bit, um, uh, that, that's, that's not quite what's going to happen. I mean, we'll get rising and falling and a lot of turbulence. Um, and I think places like Lane Spit might get some uh, water, uh, you know, uh, in a big earthquake with a tsunami. But we've got these really good sirens now. And people know that they hear that or they feel shaking, they're gonna move, uh, move up. The important thing, of course, if you start feeling anything shaking, you need to get underneath something. If you've got, like I have here, a huge bookshelf, the bookshelf is anchored, but the books aren't. <laughs> and those books can, can go, go sailing. So one does have to uh, take care of that. I personally don't know about things like, um, uh, wells and and whether or not um, we'll have trouble with uh, you know piping and things like that I think I'd, I'd try to uh, figure out some way to secure my propane tank we're thinking about strapping ours down uh, because it, in a big earthquake a propane tank could take off we do have uh, you know they require that you strap down your hot water heater well, we've strapped down our propane stove here in the house too. So um, you know, your refrigerator uh, should be secured and um, so should your propane stove. Gotcha. I think Sarah has a question. We're... Yeah, Sarah Brooke, me? Yeah, Sarah. Um, I'm just curious if there's any other outcropping volcanics other than those few circles that you showed and I was looking at a, a UBC student's thesis the other day um, and they talked about the real harbor volcanics are those the pillow basalts that you were talking about yeah there's some there too yeah right right over there um, between Anadi Bay and real harbor there's an outcrop that's got pillow basalt and chert um, I've tried to find the one on the west side of the island, uh, the southwest side of the island, and I think I found it, but that's better seen at the tide. Um, will, you do a, will you do a geology field trip so sometime once everyone's vaccinated? <laughs> <laughs> we could try something like that, yeah. Thank you. And some, Alan says, you mentioned the old map water flowing going along Legal Bay. Are there any current signs of that left? Well, um, yeah, that, that water flows uh, down from uh, a wetland area by Scott Josiah's place um, and uh, John Granger's place. There, there's a wet area up there and that water is flowing down. And of course it's been channeled now more because of the, all the alteration in the, in the land and um, everything's been changed on the island. It, um, but um, there is still drainage there that goes down under uh, South Nugent. Okay. 
is the lake you can see from the Baker Overlook Natural or it there is a fault uh, that when I was uh, hiking when Bert and I were hiking one time with Kent Nielsen uh, up on the uh, up on the mountain he's a structural geologist so he was fascinated by uh, the way the the whole land um, uh, is formed and it looks to me like that the Baker Lake uh, is an old fault area uh, and it likely has been enhanced, but I've only been there once and I can't remember quite uh, some of the details about it, uh, but I think, I think it's likely been dammed up some, wouldn't you say? Yeah, Bert agrees with me. It's, it's likely been dammed up, but it's natural, I think. Um, it's and there's, ledge. it's, pardon? It's a natural ledge. Yeah, it's a natural ledge. Cool. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this was someone who popped in a little bit late, but Elizabeth, can you talk anything about the palm tree fossil that's north of Sunset Beach and the aging of that or any of that information? Well, I'm pretty sure that that's not a Palm Beach, uh, that, that's not a fossil. That, I think that's one of those uh, things that I was talking about earlier. Um, it, it's some jointing. Um, and that hasn't been completely determined. And I've got some photos of it. And I decided not to include that in here because that's one of those places where when a lot of people find out about some things, uh, they get messed up. And sometimes it's better to um, not let people know where something is. And I'm sorry about that, but that's the reality of it these days. Um, uh, but I don't believe that that's a fossil, but it's, it's a structure in the rock. Gotcha. Well, I just want to say thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing all this knowledge with us. I feel like the puzzle pieces of the island are starting to fall together, and I have a better picture of this beautiful place that we're at. Um, I do. We do try to do a participant evaluation for our program, so I'm just going to type that in the chat. I'll also send it out after this with a recording of the video for you. You can share it with a friend. We'll put it up on YouTube. Um, and then I just want to say we've got a lot of great events coming up with the Heritage Trust for the rest of the month. This coming Saturday at 10 a.m., there's a great webinar all about citizen science. You can find the link to sign up on our website. And then in the afternoon that day is like a spring roadside cleanup. So you should all come to the webinar and then head outside, gather up marine debris from the trash and roadways, and uh, use Clean Swell to log what you find. Then next week on Wednesday, we have a personal preserve meetup. So if you're interested in learning about that program or have more questions or want to find out about a plant swap, uh, you should join in on that. The link's on our website. Um, and then the following day on Thursday, we're having another great talk um, about the ecology of dead wood and why snags are so awesome. Um, and that's with Ken Bevis, and he's a real character, so it should be a fun event. And I really hope that if you guys like this tonight, you'll come and join us for more of these exciting opportunities that we have. And hopefully someday we can all be back together again. So thank you guys. Have a great evening. <laughs> Bye everybody. Thanks for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thanks Elizabeth. That was